title of my talk is Reality Liquefied. And what I'm going to do is sort of uh, sketch out a, a somewhat dystopian scenario looking at our contemporary moment and then talk about some uh, ways that psychedelics, uh, magical thinking, and meditation sort of engage uh, our current condition. So this is a very strange time for someone of my generation. Uh, I was born in the summer of love, 1967, in California. Uh, and I grew up in, in California in kind of the residue of the counterculture. Uh, so I was interested from when I was a teenager in the late 70s, 1980s in psychedelics, uh, esotericism, magic, uh, shamanism to a degree, although I've learned more about that later. And I've always stayed interested in these things. I've, had, I've been a freelance writer and I got a PhD and I, I sort of work with one foot in the underground and one foot in the mainstream world, kind of writing and translating between. And why I say to, uh, to these days are very strange for me, and I think a lot of people of my generation, is that many of the things that we have been identified with our whole lives as part of the underground, psychedelics, meditation, uh, indigenous views, uh, magic, in, in esotericism, the occult, all of these things are now, if not quite mainstream, then very much expanding rapidly beyond the underground where we kept it going. You know, in the late 1980s and the 1990s to write about psychedelic drugs was a very countercultural thing to do. And now it's incredibly mainstream. Everybody's doing it. New York Times, this and that, psychedelic renaissance. So why is that? Why have these things sort of jumped the breach? Now, there have always been waves of interest in the esoteric throughout mo the modern West. In the late 19th century, big explosion of esotericism, a little bit of drugs. The 1920s, another big explosion of mysteries, Egyptian schools, uh, breathing techniques, so lots of New Age, what we would call New Age kinds of practices. Big explosion then. And then, of course, in the 60s and 70s huge explosion where it became a little bit more mainstream for a while. Uh, in the 90s, we get this sort of other blip, but it's still kind of underground, electronic music, and now, as I said, it's everywhere. Why? Well, I think that there, the conditions that we're living under now, which I could call simply the breakdown of consensus reality, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, that the breakdown of consensus reality almost naturally pulls out of us our inclination to work and engage the world as an enchanted, magical place and as a place where practices of attention and consciousness are almost survival necessities. So what do I mean by the, the breakdown of consensus reality? The phrase consensus reality has a nice kind of ring to it, because if you talk about reality, I mean, that's a big question, you know, what is reality? But we can talk more clearly about consensus reality. Uh, the guys who came up with this phrase were in the 60s. It's from a book called The Social Construction of Reality. And what they say is like, look, every one of us individually builds our own reality through our nervous system or the way that our incorporeal consciousness interacts with our body you know, leave that question aside. But we have our own individual reality, our own sensation, our own patterns of thinking. But of course, when we're brought into, we're born into a society, that means we're born into a world with language. We're born into a world with rituals, with cultural symbols, with educational institutions. And all of these things help shape, program, uh, give us the guides, the maps for that particular uh, society. And of course, different societies have very different maps and models. And in the West, we inherit a particular one. And that's what I'm kind of talking about today. I'll talk a, talk a little bit about indigenous styles in a bit. But in our modern world, let's say the 20th century, uh, consensus reality is sort of the world that we share 
and it's partly maintained and constructed through institutions. Again, educational institutions, you know, your family traditions too, but, but very much education, media, you know, uh, and we also grow up naturally absorbing a kind of scientific or rationalist or technologically oriented, tool oriented thinking, which is often coupled with a certain kind of, we can call it the ego, that's maybe a tough word, let's say self with a small s, where there's, I want to do things in the world, I have desires I want to satisfy, so I use tools and things to manipulate reality to get what I want. And that's very much intrinsic to the Western way of constructing reality. Now, there's a lot of ways of talking about how reality is melting down now. There's a, a wonderful phrase from Karl Marx. He says he's, he's anticipating the future of kind of excessive capitalism, when the crazy capitalism that he already saw in the 19th century was going to take off even farther and, and, and reach its tentacles into every element of existence. He said, all that is solid melts into air. And what he meant is that the conditions of living in capitalism, of living in, in, a, in a world of exchange value, tends to kind of dematerialize the things in our world. And I think we can all kind of get a kind of a gut sense of what, what that's like, because more and more of our time is spent in this digital space. And now, of course, the digital space is with us everywhere we go. I've got, I've got one of those surveillance, oh, the, so, sorry, mobile phones too. And, uh, and so we're much more used to kind of breaking down the difference between this world and the other world. But I think one of the easiest ways to understand this kind of liquefaction of consensus reality is through media. The 20th century was the era of mass media. In the early 1910s, 1920s in particular, people started to figure out like, hey, we can use this mass media stuff to control people's minds or, if you, in a slightly nicer way, you know, uh, shape their desires or per learn how to uh, to uh, market things to them that they might like or they might enjoy. So we start to see the era of major propaganda. So propaganda, whether we think about it in terms of a state, like nationalist propaganda, where they're putting out a certain story about the state and the leader and, and you know, leading to fascism in the, in the 30s, very much comes out of that kind of mass media mind. You know, Adolf Hitler was a master of radio. He was a master of voice projected through loudspeakers and through the radio. So one of the ways of understanding how could Germany have gone so insane in the 1930s has to do with the power of that particular medium. So to understand consensus reality in the 20th century, you have to think about the media. What do they have? They got radio and you got television. And you got the telephone system, phonograph records, tape machines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, for many decades, mass media really held sway. Uh, I remember in the early 1990s, I was writing a lot about technology. And it was just the era when like, cable systems were really opening up. And we could kind of get a glimmer of what it meant to have a future where there were hundreds if not thousands of channels. You know, this was before the internet, before YouTube, all of that stuff. And I, rem I wrote a piece about it, and I was like, what you have there is a meltdown of the mass media. And we can complain a lot about mass media in the 20th century, about programming, propaganda, consumerism, how much we were programmed as consumers by seeing images of things we wanted, of a perfect life that was going to solve our, our little problems. Uh, but it, the mass media did do a reasonably good job of maintaining something like consensus reality. You know, when I was first growing up, there were only a few news networks that everybody watched. So even if you were a radical, and you thought the, these guys were insane and it was a war machine and they were lying to us, you still had a reference point that shared and resonated with much larger groups of people. 
the metaphor of resonation is really key here. You know, we all, I think, have a sense of resonance. You know, maybe we mean when we meet somebody else that we really like, there's something special, we feel like it resonates. Or somebody says something and it, it rings a bell in our head and we're like, yeah, 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 that's it, that's it. That's that sense of resonance, just like the way with bells or, or musical instruments, you can resonate a room. You can send out a kind of energy wave that resonates, that bounces, that increases energy with somebody else. And in a way, mass media was a way of resonating huge populations to the same kinds of stories and the same kinds of images. So what we're having now with the internet, with everybody's a publisher, with everybody has a, a, a YouTube channel, everybody you know, can, can put stuff out there, is that we have this breakdown of the mass media. And I think every country experiences it differently. So I'm very much speaking from an American point of view, but it's very, very visible there, very visible there because of the way in which different news sources tell different stories. They have different talking points. They're practicing propaganda in different ways. And I, I'm at the point, even though I'm, you know, I'm kind of a progressive liberal with some radical anarchist, you know, I'm kind of a mess politically. But in general, I've sort of aligned myself with the, the, with the liberal progressive left. But now even the, the liberal media is just as toxic as the conservative media. It's just as much running on these kinds of, like the sort of dwindling attempt to maintain mass media control. And at the same time, you have this explosion of alternative worldviews. Uh, of, you know, conspiracy theories, left and right, uh, all sorts of science and quasi-science and pseudoscience and outright lying. And everybody's got a channel and we're all sitting there trying to kind of tune in, trying to figure out how to deal with the situation. So uh, I'm going to show a video in a second and I just want to mention three elements. There's a, again, there's so many things to talk about with how fast reality or consensus reality or technology, science is changing and how incredibly confusing and turbulent and un self undermining this process is even as it's also full of potential and possibility and whether you like it or not it's where we are but i want to mention three things that uh, i think are really germane to this uh, creepy video we're about to watch uh, but the three elements that, I, that that are represented in this video uh, are surveillance and by surveillance i don't just mean state surveillance where they're you know, logging all your phone records and keeping a list of all your contacts, you know, on a shelf somewhere. So if they need it, they can pull it out. I'm also talking very much about corporate surveillance, consumer surveillance, the surveillance that we all participate in. If you ever go to Amazon and go on a recommended link, if you do a Google search, all of your Google searches are based on particular demographics to you. There's no objective Google where if I type in Eric Davis, it's going to get the same things that you're going to get if you type in my name, Eric Davis. So we're, the consumer capitalism has learned how to focus individually and to see, track your behavior as a consumer and make anticipations about how you're going to behave in the future. And so we're already not only being watched, but our opportunities, the ads we see, the uh, links that are sent our way are already being shaped according to these algorithms that are anticipating our behavior. So that's surveillance. Uh, another uh, uh, element is, is the, what I, which I mentioned to briefly before, is a kind of breakdown between our physical reality, this material reality we share that is part of consensus reality. We're in this room together. Maybe it doesn't ultimately exist, but as far as consensus goes, we can all say, yeah, we're in this room sharing space and time together. And then we have this weird digital other world, this internet world, this hyperspace, this, this uh, cyberspace, whatever you want to call it. And one of the things that's happening now and will continue to happen with more and more uh, ferocity uh, is the breakdown of these two worlds. By carrying our little computers with us, we've already broken down a lot because we're always tracked, we're always on some, we're always recognized, we can always access the great mind. But in the future, as they come up with things like augmented reality, and this is an augmented reality piece that we're going to see, then you have, imagine, 
whether it's like a Google Glass or it's on your eyeball or whatever it is, you have some kind of transparent screen that allows you to sort of overlay physical reality with data. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons people are very excited about it. There's some cool opportunities for play, for uh, understanding the world, for travel. There's a lot of interesting things that can be done with this. But one thing it definitely does is it undermines the physical solidity of the material world by overlaying it with the weirdness of the digital and all of its hyperdimensions, all of its information excess, all of its tracking, all of its algorithms. So that's sort of in, you know, kind of weaving itself into this reality. And the third element that, that I want to bring out that we'll also see here is what you could call the quantified self. How many, how many people have heard that term, quantified self? Okay, just a few of you. What it means is there's sort of a culture of efficiency about how I can live my life better, how I can uh, manifest my desires, how I can be more productive, more healthy, maybe even more spiritual. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use tracking devices that are kind of moderating me or they're giving me feedback about how, how I'm exercising and what I'm, whether I'm exercising enough and giving me little prompts. Hey, it's time to meditate. Okay, I better meditate now. And using technology as a way to circulate your own uh, self-actualization, let's call it. So all of those things are brought together in a very dystopian way in this video, which I probably a few of you have seen. It, it, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, but I'm going to show it now, and then we'll talk about how it, how it works from that. Apúrate si quieres una buena calificación. Voy lo más rápido que puedo. Has pensado en correr. Es saludable y eficiente. Seguro que no hay más trabajos disponibles. Yo estudié para ser profesora y estoy haciendo mercados. Y además puedes quedarte con los puntos de fidelización. Eres una monje afortunada. Tienes que confiar en la aplicación. Te sientes inspirada. Gracias. Chao. ¿Quién soy yo? No, no es lo que quiero decir. ¿Para dónde voy? No. Puedo volver a empezar. Volví algo. Estoy libre de mi ira. Estoy libre de mi tristeza. El amor es mi Adiós. Buen día, Emilio. 
¿Qué puedo hacer por usted? ¿Qué está pasando? Mis puntos están bien. No se preocupe, sus puntos están seguros conmigo. ¿Le puedo ayudar en algo más, Emilio? Yo no soy Emilio, yo soy Juliana Restrepo. Por favor, espero. Hola, Juliana Restrepo. Me alegra verte. ¿Qué puedo hacer por ti? Mis puntos están bien. ¿Qué está pasando? Tranquila, todo está bien. Parece que alguien está intentando vulnerar su cuenta. Por favor, espere mientras reinicio su dispositivo. Ah. Hola Juliana, me alegra verte. Hoy te ves hermosa. ¿Estás estrenando zapatos? Ya lo arreglaron. Tengo que seguir trabajando. Estoy trabajando en eso, pero necesito verificar tu información biométrica. Por favor, sigue la línea azul hasta el centro de servicio más cercano para confirmar tu identidad. Sí, pero mis puntos están bien. Todo está bien. Chao. So this is obviously a very dystopian scenario. Uh, and I've talked already a little bit about the elements that, that are in it. And I want to use it as an example of another way of approaching this condition. Do I think something like this is necessarily going to happen? No. Do I think it's likely? Yes, to some degree, uh, particularly for people who don't uh, have the means to avoid these kinds of mechanisms of control. Now, but there's something very odd about this uh, particular scenario, this particular video, which is that if you are a psychonaut, and if you are a magic user, you recognize this language. There's something strangely familiar about this very degraded world. You have multiple layers of information. There are various portals that open up. There's strange kind of animated creatures that come at you. You're navigating through a material space that's also layered with multidimensional spaces. And there's still the, the trace or the presence of what we could call religion or spirituality. And that's the part you see at the end where she kind of goes into the, into the church and it's sort of part of the same language. And so the reason I'm making these connections is not to say that this is a wonderful psychedelic magical world that awaits us, although there are certainly many people who are going to sell these technologies who are going to say precisely that, precisely that. But more so to say that, that I think that the reason or one of the reasons we're seeing this return of enchantment, of interest in magic, of interest in psychedelics, of interest in indigenous worldviews, is that strangely enough, as consensus reality melts down 
and the evil forces or the dark manipulative forces become even bolder and even stronger and even more intimately involved with your subjectivity. There's an almost natural response. Julian yesterday talked about it. We have an instinct to navigate altered states. We have an instinct to enchant, to connect with the world in a different way than our normal, everyday, modern, secular, scientific self. And so what's sort of happening now is almost like, I don't want to overplay the military metaphors, but something like an arms race. So let's talk a little bit about this return, you know, of enchantment on some level. You have, we, we've, the psychedelic renaissance we all know about. We all know about the studies, the interests of the military, for example, in the United States. The military is very interested in the MDMA research that MAPS is putting out. MAPS has gotten money from, uh, from a very, very right-wing reactionary uh, group of billionaires, the Mercer family. And they've gotten some money because the Mercers like the idea that we can help soldiers. I want to help soldiers too. I don't want anyone to have PTSD. But this should already indicate something to us, that as the psychedelic renaissance happens, all the players, everybody, starts to go, Ah, this is pretty good. We might be able to use this in a good way. Entertainment, propaganda, the military, state control, nefarious religious organizations. Everybody's going, hey, things are getting wiggy out there. We can play our hands strong. And in one way of saying what's happening in the, in the world out of this marvelous paradise is that everybody's playing their big hand. Everybody sees that reality is so uh, tentative, so, so full of possibility, that now is the time to really go for it, to really control. And that's partly what we're seeing with the rise of fascism and nationalism. It's very complicated, but that's one aspect of it. So there's some great stuff about this, you know? The, the growth of global transformational festivals the increase of attention to indigenous worldviews and indigenous life ways, the growth of environmentalism, of permaculture, the spreading of these ideas around the world, uh, the, the return of a kind of magical engagement that we're all sort of involved here. But at the same time, at the same time, these same sort of possibility spaces are being used and will continue to be used by more nefarious forces. And if you do your homework, if you study how magic actually works in like anthropological conditions, if you read anthropology, and there's some terrible anthropology that's very colonialist and very old school, and there's some marvelous anthropology that is very rich and very nuanced about how it thinks about these things. And one of the things you find is that, you know, generally where there's magic, there's, you know, good healing stuff and there's nasty darts, you know? Uh, people who are really into ayahuasca, uh, often people have a pretty naive idea about what's actually the whole cultural matrix that is behind ayahuasca. So you can go and enjoy an ayahuasca circle. You have a profound experience. Everything is very healing and very loving. But if you actually train with uh, a, a shaman or a, you know, a master, a maestro, vegetalismo, then at some point on your story, you're going to have to deal with the evil darts. There's rival shamans over the hill that hate this guy, and there's a long-standing feud, and now you're part of the feud. Okay, what are you going to do with that? And we already kind of know this from navigating ayahuasca space. There's definitely places you're like, whoa, I don't know about this one. And as Julian also pointed out yesterday, you know, anytime you, you encounter the... Uh, the, the more uh, disturbing figures, you always sort of greet, acknowledge, and perhaps try to get their name or who they are. This is, you know, ye oldy magic tricks. But sometimes you got to bail. Sometimes you got to close that door if you can uh, uh, and, and sort of work with it. So there's a weird way in which these worlds are sort of kind of overlapping. But there's a lot of nefarious stuff too. I'll mention one more example. And I think we can kind of see this in terms of nationalism everywhere, that nationalism is kind of like a big magical myth, that nationalism is a sort of enchanted way of seeing the world. There's some kind of spirit of the people 
the Hungarian people. We have a spirit. We come from a place. We have a story. We have folkways. We have our own essence. And there's a lot of great stuff in there. That's where we connect with our own indigeneity. So we're in a very paradoxical situation as, as Euro-Americans because on the one hand, we need to go into the space of na not really nationalism, but you know, our own indigenous roots that then gets appropriated by nationalism and turned into a magical myth that circulated through media and that, and that very much satisfies the incredible anxiety all of us feel because that world is coming and in some sense is already here. Very disturbing. How do we deal with that? I want a solid story. I want to know who I am. I want to know where the boundaries are. I'm with my folks. We're all together. <sighs> Excellent. So there's a potential in that kind of enchanted thinking for that sort of behavior. In America, leading up to the election of Trump, there was this sort of explosion of alt what we called alt-right, the sort of new reactionary forces online, particularly, although elsewhere, too. And one of the things that they practiced was what they called meme magic. They, it was the magic of memes. How do you create memes that go out like little viruses into the information universe, propagate themselves through devices and human minds, and nudge or make fun of or somehow erode the forces that would prevent Trump from becoming elected. It was very funny, it was very sarcastic, very postmodern, all these things that we don't normally associate with the right wing. Uh, and they explicitly talk about it in terms of magic, and in fact, you can trace some connections between these alt-right magic users and more traditional sources of magic that influenced me, like chaos magic or Aleister Crowley. So, there are aspects of this enchanted world that are very difficult. And so we need, to be, we need to be skeptical shamans or skeptical animists. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. How do we develop tools that will enable us to both open up to the enchanted, open up to the connections we need for ourselves, for our communities, for our environments, our local environments, for the planetary consciousness, for all beings throughout space and time, but at the same time to keep very savvy, very savvy, very sharp, not so mushy, because there's a lot of ill in the mush. I remember, I think it was my, my first ayahuasca journey. I won't go long, uh, but having sort of you know, achieved launching speed and left the planetary sphere after a sort of movie about the future disasters, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with from, from journeys. There I was in the cosmos, filled with intelligence, filled with entities, worlds, beings, modes of reality, dimensions. And my basic feeling was like, it's kind of like the internet. I mean, there's like, this guy and that guy and that gal and they, this guy's saying that and that guy's saying that and they all want something from me and they're like, whoa, I, I hold on here. You know, like, I, I'm not just going to get on your ship. You know, we got to have a little conversation here. And I think in some ways, one of the reasons that psychedelics resonates for us now is because it gets us familiar with how to navigate through very tricksy domains where there are places we don't really want to go or would prefer not to go. And if we do have to go there, we have tools. We have tools to work with those things. And that also means tools to work with the memes, the stories that are coming your way. So I said skeptical, and I said animism. So what I mean by skepticism, I don't mean scientific skepticism. I don't mean like, like we just saw a, a talk about radionics. A scientific skeptic would go, bullshit. Don't even look at it. It's horseshit. There's no way that this could possibly work because we don't have a story about why that works. I'm not talking about that kind of skepticism. That's shitty skepticism because it's not actually skepticism. Actual skepticism is where you place a tremendous amount of importance on your experience, on empirical experience. And when it comes to stories about what's going on, eh, you hold them lightly, like as lightly as you can. In fact, the more lightly you can hold the stories, including stories you need, like, I need to be good to my parents, you know, they were very sweet to me, I should, you know, I should honor them. Well, it's a story, you know, we've come up to, 
that's a good one to keep around. I'm going to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm fine with that one. But to learn to hold stories, especially stories about what's happening, what's truth, what do we actually know. And the thing is funny about science is if you are a scientist or if you know scientists, and if you do, you should talk to them about this precise thing, is you find that they actually study most of the time a very small part of reality, very small, like one kind of serotonin receptor. You know, they're, well, I'm just a 5 h degree guy. That's all I do. I have a stack of papers like this to read through. And if you ask them, what do we know about the thing you actually study? It's like, whoa, it's really confusing. There's a lot of different stories. We don't really know that much. But when they get out of that field, but we, you know, we know science, we know radionics is bullshit. You know, there's just no way it could work. And, you know, I don't know if radionics is bullshit because I haven't done the work. I haven't gone in there. I know people who are into it. I know people who I trust because they're kind of my, on my team. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it really grows corn, really. Look, look, look at the pictures. And I'm like, great, okay, I don't know. And be okay with, I don't know. But like, I don't know is like a kind of joy. I don't know is kind of like an openness. It's not like, oh my God, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It's good, it's healing, it's, it's, it's medicine. Doubt is a medicine. Skepticism in the way that I'm talking about is a medicine. So one problem I think people who come from the West science, technology, consumerism, and then they discover the enchanted other world, the magical world of, of occult forces and, and shamans and spirits from other dimensions and UFOs, is that they look back at that and go, ah, God, that's the horrible, ugh, let's get away from that. And you lose something. It's very precious. Always take with you your inner skeptic. You know, you got an inner shaman, you got an inner lover, you got an inner worker. We have a lot of, a whole, you know, panoply of personalities inside of us. But treat your, your inner skeptic with great respect and bring him along or her along for the ride because it's a kind of magic. Some story is coming your way. Some, oh, I actually, I, I think I may, I think what I'm doing right now in my psychedelic experience is to transform reality. I am a messianic figure. This happens to people all the time. So what do you do with that? Do you be believe it? Do you believe it in the morning? Some people believe it in the morning. That's when my skeptic comes in and goes, you had fun last night. But let's really think about this a little bit. And it's a very great way of balancing the magical experience. The other side of it, which is key and relates to this video, is the way that you saw that the technology was reaffirming her personality, her person. So she got a male person to talk to her. When the thing sketched out and thought it was a guy, then everything changed and it's the sexy girl and the girl comes up. And what they're doing there is reinforcing your personality. And we're all doing this all the time. We have our personalities, the things we like, things we don't know. You know, we are personalities amongst other things. But the system is very, very interested in you maintaining your personality. And in fact, giving you exactly what you want. Exactly figuring out what it is what you want. So if you have a nice little inner skeptic on board who's going like, who are you anyway? I mean, really? Are you really that person? Are you really those cultural programs? Are you really that belief you have about who you are? Well, no, actually you're not. You're bigger than that. You're way bigger than that. And that's part of the way that the skepticism can be part of a meditative path, can be part of a path of what I call inquiry, which is a nicer word than skepticism. You're always asking questions. You're always probing. Sorry, you don't, get, you don't get it off. You don't get an answer, and then you can relax. I mean, you can get like something that's working, and you keep going into it farther and farther and farther. But don't let that thing uh, stop, because it gets in the way, the self. It gets, in, it gets in the way. So the other side, so skeptical and then animism. And then I'll cram it in here. Maybe we're going to have questions. What I mean by that is basically the magical universe, a universe that is alive, not just alive as a totality, but as alive of many specific things. Rocks, plants, animals, birds, electricity, technology, ideas. Not just the nice natural world that's like the indigenous world we want to go back to, but everything. Everything is alive and everything is relational. And not only is it relational, the world is filled with non-human persons. So this is an animist worldview. It doesn't work over here in the secular world. That's just a projection, a projection. But that's not true. It's not just a projection. Let's say that our ability to connect with the magical world, 
whether through psychedelics, through ritual practice, through uh, you know, shamanic systems, through magic. It's a faculty that we have. The way that we talk about smell is a faculty. My nose does it. Nothing else does it. My nose system really works with the smells. My eye system really works with the, with the visual imagery. It's a faculty. Memory is a faculty. And related to memory is the faculty of what we could call the imagination. And the imagination is not just a projection we put out on the world. That's what these guys are going to say. Oh, you're just projecting. That's bullshit. You're just noticing correlations that don't actually exist. You're da da da. No. The imagination is an interface that allows us to engage what is outside of us, what we can't understand in our own terms, the alien, the inhuman, or the non-human. So the, the imagination is a faculty that can be trained, and we train it through psychedelics, through intentional psychedelics, we train it through magic, we train it to a degree through meditation, though most meditation doesn't amplify the, the uh, imagination as much, though some Tibetan visualizations go whole hog, uh, in that realm. And in building up the imagination, we're not just building up our personal little reality, like my little new age, like, oh, I'm, I create my own reality, this is my reality, and it's like this. And it's a kind of bubble-headed, well, it's like a bubble. You're in a bubble of like my story about how reality works. That's kind of, I think, sort of bullshit spirituality. I think that's, that's the stuff the system wants you to have, because the system is into spirituality. It likes yoga. It likes mindfulness. There's tons of corporate mindfulness. There are tons of people who are doing yoga just to enhance their egos. And there are tons, and I'm not kidding, investment bankers up the wazoo drinking ayahuasca. What are they thinking? What happens to them? What stories do they get? I have no fucking idea. But everybody's tuning in. Everybody's tuning in. So it's really key to have an ability to break through your own wish fulfillment. And that's where the skepticism and the animism uh, work together very beautifully. I want to end with just a, a few quotes from Dogen Zenji, uh, who was a great Zen master in Japan, 13th century, who founded the Soto Zen lineage. And what he said was, there's two quotes I want to read. One is, to carry the self forward and illuminate myriad things is delusion that myriad things come forth and illuminate the self is enlightenment. So what he's talking about there is we have our self and we're going out there and we're trying to engage the world and there is a kind of projection. We're kind of like putting it forward. Maybe we're building like an interface. How do we imagine this world of myriad things? But if we're driving from that lower, from that small s self, that we're just in delusion. But to get the self out of the way, to allow it to break down, to be okay with not knowing who you are, what's going on, what's around you, who's alive, who's intelligent, to let that happen and then allow reality as it is to come in with, you know, paying attention is what he's talking about is, uh, is awakening. And there's another quote that's very similar, but it gives you a different angle that I want to leave you with. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things, which means everything. Beautiful little story there. And because for me, that is both skepticism and animism, and I'm talking about it. To study the way, we have to start with who we are. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why am I programmed this way? Why do I like these people? Why am I thinking this way? Is this really true? And we can spend our whole lives that, deconstructing the self, psychologizing the self, processing the self. And at some point, you just say, forget it. Stop. Stop already. And then what happens? Then you're open to myriad things, which means if you're tuning in, if your imagination is keyed, it means the spirit of the wood, of the flower, of the uh, drum machine, of the other people, of the other beings, of all beings throughout space and time. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.